This is the Vive Dino FormBot Raptor 2.0, and on paper, it's an absolutely fantastic machine. It's got a 400 by 400 by 500 millimeter build space that's about seven or eight times as much volume as the midsize Ender 3 or Prusa Mark III class. It also comes with ball screws for the Z-axis, sturdy linear rails, Marlin 2.0, dynamic drivers, a hot end and heat bed combo that are promised to go up to 350 degrees and 150 degrees respectively, a beer touch sensor, and they even offer a laser engraver kit for the Raptor because that's safe. But none of that matters. If you know my mentality about reviews, you'll know that I usually never change parts on a printer and always try to assess it the way the manufacturer intended it to be used. But I've already started upgrading this, not because I love this machine so much, but because I had no other choice. It looks like this printer was entirely designed by a marketing department and not by someone who has used a 3D printer before and knows how to build a proper one. So let's get into it. So on the surface, this looks like a very juicy machine. Even though it costs between $900 and 1100 euros, that's still considered extremely affordable for a printer this big. Usually big printers like the CR10 are just stretched versions of their smaller models, but in this case Vive Dino actually went that extra step and adapted some components for the bigger build volume. The actually fairly nice supported rails on the Z and Y axis uh, help with rigidity, and they went all the way up to 40 millimeter aluminum profile for the frame, which makes it properly rigid, I'll give it that much. Also, the heated bed is a high power 230 volt model. That makes a lot of sense for the size, since even a 24 volt bed would require a massive power supply, even if they just gave it a mediocre power output. You can check one of my classic videos on heated bed selection somewhere up here. Now, a considerable amount of what you're gonna be paying for this printer is just to get it shipped to you. Since this machine is heavy, it comes in a large box and somehow needs to be shipped from China to your doorstep. And by the way, even if it says free shipping on the product page, you're still paying for shipping. It's just factored into the price of the printer itself. Duh. So why did I upgrade the extrusion setup on the Raptor 2.0 to a Himera and a Super Volcano, you ask? Well, it was unusable garbage, just like everything else on this machine that isn't nicely listed as an, oh, we've got this fancy component style of feature. Three issues specifically with the stock tool head right out of the gate. One, the cooling fan was broken out of the box, no quality control there. Two, the extruder hot end combo was so weak that I couldn't even run the normal printing speeds I'd run on something like a stock Prusa. So I had to slow down the Raptor to under a filament flow rate of five cubic millimeters a second. For comparison, a Mark III with the stock slicing profiles and everything already goes up to 12 cubic millimeters per second and it's still got headroom there. The maximum of five cubic millimeters a second in the Raptor mean that really you're not going to be printing at more than a 0.2 millimeter layer height without severely decreasing your feed rates or you're going to have skipped steps all over the place and at that point it just doesn't make sense to go with larger layer heights. You'll have to slow down so much that your prints are still going to take just as long. Combine the slower print speed with the massive build volume and you're talking about measuring your print times in weeks, not hours. I'm assuming here that you're looking into getting a large printer like this because you actually want to print large things, right? Now, I'd be able to look past that and just go, okay, if it takes two weeks to print stuff, that's fine. I'm not running this machine nonstop anyways. That would be pretty expensive pretty fast. But the problem is it can't even do a two week print or a two day print without skipping steps. Pretty much every large print I did with the Raptor, obviously on this one you can see it, on this one it's right down here at the start. Uh, every large print ended up with shifted layers somewhere. Somewhere better, somewhere worse, but trying to use this printer for big parts just ended up being a waste of perfectly good filament. I'm using 2.6 kilogram spools uh, of PLA that Dust Filament supplied me with. Uh, you know, using the 800 gram spools is a bit of a pain with a printer this large. You know, it does have a filament sensor. You'll just end up swapping spools left and right. So why is this printer so unreliable? Maybe, just maybe, it's because they're using a single NEMA 17 motor with this absolutely chungus 
of a heated bed. Yes, Trinamic drivers are nice and they can provide sufficient current to run normal printers just fine, but to get proper torque out of them, you need to pick matching motors and especially with the TMC2208 that they used and with similar drivers, you do need to provide good cooling and I'm just not sure how much these gooped on heat sinks actually do. And the fact that they're using Polulu sized driver boards also doesn't help with giving it a surface to dissipate heat. So yeah, this is not an adequate driver and motor combination for this size printer. And also, yes, these are Trinamic drivers, but not one of the ones that do support the uh, stall guard step, uh, skipped step detection. So yeah, stuff like this you know, just happens and the printer is none the wiser, just keeps on going. Like I said, I've had some sort of a skip in almost all of my larger prints. Okay, let's move on or we're not, uh, we're not done with the bed yet. So as I mentioned, this is a 230 volt silicone heater attached to an aluminum sheet with a PEI sheet up top that's being held down with adhesive. So far, so good. I actually like this way of building heated beds since it's powerful with that silicone heater and it creates a really nice evenly heated surface. Again, a few issues though. First off, what the f <coughs> is up with this wiring? So there are two power cords, one with the red sleeving um, from the silicone heater cable wired into a Shuko plug with no ground connected. And then there's a second IEC connector with a three pin cable um, that powers the electronics and all of that. That seems a bit weird to me, just having a device with two separate power cords for two separate areas of functionality. Then what's up with this solid state relay installation here? Wiring zip tied to the aluminum frame? That's something I do in a rush, but only for building a one-off prototype for something, not a machine that's meant to be sold. Also, the high voltage side right here seems to be a bit lacking on insulation. I mean, they've got this printed cover, but that's not even fastened down. And uh, when you push it aside, that's, that's 230 volts right there. Like, just put it in a box, all right? When you look at where the high voltage wiring goes, you may be surprised that it actually goes into a drag chain in here. Um, that's going up to the moving bed. That might sound like a good thing, um, but it's not. I think Adam from Vector3D first pointed this out to me where his cable had completely rubbed through and started to show blank wire, which again, that's 230 volts on there. So not a great side. Um, and mine's starting to do that as well. You can see some, some fibers kind of flaking off right there already. First, neither the fabric insulation on this nor the wire itself or the way it's installed in here is the right choice for drag chain. So this setup is bound to fail. This is unacceptable and dangerous. Apparently, again, nobody bothered to stress test this machine or they would have found issues like that. The wiring in general is super weird on the Raptor 2.0. What are they using for the extruder? Sure, a, a VGA cable will do. Uh, it should be just fine being held up with a freaking spiral keychain, some zip ties and a, and a carabiner. Like, that looks legit, especially when we can see that uh, it's bending its pins and PCB every time the x-axis moves. Great design. There's loose wires going everywhere else. The x-axis is wired up with absolutely no strain relief uh, right there and I don't even want to get started on this absolute mess of a wiring job around the electronics where you've got this, this unlabeled, this is unlabeled on either PCB, 40 pin cable just going from the main board to a connector daughter board. And look, this connector isn't even crimped properly. It's already falling apart. I'm, I'm just at a, at a loss of words here, guys. And this was only me getting sidetracked from the heated bed. So back to that. It's nice that it's got that, that PEI film on it, um, but the claim of 150 degrees Celsius is just a, a straight up lie. I tried heating it up uh, that far and immediately had the adhesive holding down the PEI sheet up top here start to bubble up. And I don't even want to know what that layer in between the silicone heater on the bottom looks like uh, and the aluminum sheet. There's also similar adhesive down there. This is not 150 degrees Celsius heated bed. It does 120 just fine, but not more. And also, prints are almost impossible to remove from this one. A flat sheet like this is fine for smaller machines, but when you've got a, a 300 millimeter or 400 millimeter part in there, 
Good luck peeling that off. It's not easy and the PI they use doesn't really let go of the parts much as it cools down. This is, this is borderline unusable. Like try getting something like this off uh, without something like a flex bed. Even adding adhesive to the surface that might not grip as much when it's cooled down isn't totally going to solve this. It's still going to be crazy hard to remove parts. And while we're talking about false advertising on max temperature, the hot end, well, this one, is also claimed to go up to 350 degrees Celsius. But this is a Teflon line type that is not only going to destroy itself if you go much over 250 degrees Celsius, it will also start releasing a deadly neurotoxin when it overheats. So why would they label it as a 350 degree capable hot end? I don't know, but as always, one shouldn't assume malice for what stupidity can explain. Now, they are running Marlin 2.0 on this machine, which seems like a nice touch. But, and I know at this point you expect that there was going to be a but, there are two ish issues with this. First, first, this isn't just Marlin 2.0, this specifically is Marlin 2.0 beta. They're running an officially unfinished software on the machine they're shipping out to customers. And I disagree with that choice. A beta release, by definition, isn't ready to be used outside of testing and validation. So it might still do weird things, anywhere between failing to calculate its movement paths correctly, freezing in the middle of a print, or just randomly burning your house down, which this printer is very much capable of doing, since it has some of the essential safety features of Marlin disabled. Also, you might think Marlin 2.0 and go straight to 32 bit, but the Raptor 2.0 is actually running that same old Atmega 2560 chip that we've been using forever. It's fine, it does the job, but we're at the point where newer 32 bit chips are supported just as nicely by Marlin and they even cost less. So I don't really get the choice of sticking with this ancient chip. Like, why go Marlin 2.0 without also going for a modern processor? It's not the only weird design choice in this machine. Like, what is this? A giant aluminum heatsink on the front of the bed? This conducts so much heat away from the bed and it's just for, for decoration? Then what's up with this belt tensioner back here? Did they just send someone out to the hardware store to build this as a, as a last minute add-on? Like, what the heck? Also, the motor pulley on the Y-axis isn't perfectly lined up, but that's the least of its issues. The spool mount up here, I guess, I mean, it works, but I found it pretty unstable once the machine starts moving and you have to readjust it for every spool size by doing a cap head screw back here. And obviously, since it's having the spool right on its edge, it doesn't work with every spool type. Cardboard spools aren't great with it. Then for the hot end, we've already talked plenty about how bad the combination of the stock hot end and extruder are. Um, but on top of that, they chose a V6 style clone, not even a volcano style hot end with that longer melt zone and possibly in larger nozzle. This is a 0.4 millimeter nozzle. If there's a printer where a volcano or even a super volcano makes sense, it's this one, which is one of the reasons why I gave it a super volcano pretty much straight away. And of course, this one didn't work, so whatever. I could keep going here, but I think you, you get the idea. This is a printer that looks really fun on the surface, and it actually was for a few prints that I got out of it, um, but it's not nearly reliable or well built enough to actually use it. I mean, within two dozen prints, you'll already have spent more on filament than on the printer itself. So at this size, it just makes a lot of sense to have something that's actually making use of that material and not just wasting it on failed prints. And I was shocked to see this very printer listed at a store like 3D Prima. This is not a machine that has CE or any certificate that would indicate that it's safe or even legal to sell in the EU and there's absolutely no chance it would conform to CE. Remember, CE is a rule set to protect you as the customer. Yet these stores seem to be selling at just no questions asked, so I really have to call them out here. And it's not just this very printer under the FormBot or Vive Dino brand. Someone recently asked me about the TardyBot, which is an IDEX printer with the same size as the Raptor and it looks to be built in much of the same fashion, if not even by the same company on the same assembly line. It's got the same frame, same bed style, linear rail, spool mount, etc. It's even got the same weird LED light strip up top of the frame and if you look at what else FormBot are offering, it might just be a slightly modified 
Vive Dino T-Rex. So stay wary, the Vive Dino printers are probably sold under other brand names as well. So now what's, what's usually going to happen here is that the manufacturer now tries to invalidate everything I just said by going, oh yeah, you got an early sample, we've already fixed all the flaws in this new revision. Not only can it not verify that, but just the fact that they think it's okay to build and ship a machine like this to customers, I think, loses them any trust you could bestow upon a company. I cannot recommend the Raptor 2.0 and by extension any machine Vive Dino and the Rebrands are currently selling. To close out this video, I want to say thank you to all of you who are supporting the channel through Patreon, YouTube memberships or otherwise. In this month, a shout out goes to Christopher Day, Dennis Dickerson, Dexter Gillette, Dorian Gray, Phyllis Shooter, Ethan Benani, Hussein Karatas, Herbium, James C. Foley, Jimmy Lee, Jonathan Malin, Lunicorn X64, Marcus Harms, Matthew Oswald, Mike McGee, Olivares, Paul Arden, Robert Hornberg, Rudolf Mung, William Devine, and Philip Gock, James Koch, Kurt Wobbles, Neil Youngberg, Adam Creator, and Robert Baum, and everyone else who supported the channel. You can join in too. Without your support, I couldn't do critical reviews like this one and instead would be dependent on earning commissions by getting you to buy things I show through affiliate links. And that could hardly be called a review, I think. So again, thank you for watching, subscribing and ringing the bell. I'm done here. See you in the next one.